Hello and welcome to Bit Gardener's Office Hours. Uh, today we'll be talking on, uh, about measuring effect coatings. Our presenter will be Mr. Corey Cohen. He's our Senior Application Specialist. Uh, my name is John Kowalski. Um, I'm part of the marketing team here at Bit Gardener. And uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Office Hours format, um, it will begin with a 20 to 25 minute presentation, a little shorter than normal. And from there, we will open it up to um, questions, comments, um, any challenges you may be having in your own facilities. Um, we'd love to help you out and uh, get those questions answered. Uh, so if you do have questions, please log them in the Q&A box located in the bottom right hand corner of your screen and we'll get to them uh, concluding the presentation. Also, we are recording this, and uh, tomorrow morning during our follow-up materials, uh, we'll send you an email with that recording link and also um, with a PDF of this presentation. Um, so you can review, share it with colleagues, um, you know, at, at your own time or um, leisure. So with that, let me introduce Corey, and uh, he can take it over for the next little bit. Corey, it's all yours, sir. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, today's topic is measuring effect coatings. Now, this is in uh, contrast to what we would call solid coatings or solid colors, um, which just have absorption pigments in them. So effect coatings are coatings that have uh, special pigments in them that have um, special optical properties. And these optical properties are often very appealing to us. Uh, that's why they're used but um, it makes it somewhat complicated to measure and characterize these coatings. So today we'll be talking about um, the measurement of effect coatings um, and how that differs from solid colors. So today's agenda will include how to measure the color of coatings with effect pigments, how to characterize those effect pigments directly, and we'll finish by discussing um, some difference equations for multi-angle color and effect measurement. Um, so as John mentioned in our office hours style, uh, we won't be getting too far into the weeds in any one of these topics. Um, I'm gonna touch lightly on each one, and then we are going to open up the floor to questions. So let's begin. Uh, so the first topic again was multi-angle color measurement of effect coatings. Um, so effect coatings, um, first of all, something like 80% of automotive finishes are effect coatings. So we're not talking about some specialized thing that, um, that you know, is, is scarcely used. These are very, very common coatings, particularly in um, transportation, things like automobiles, boats, planes um, often use these special pigments. Um, and so they include things like metallic coatings. These are little bits of metallic flake, metallic pigments. Um, that go into the paint, um, and this serves to accentuate the curved profile of things like this very pretty and curvy silver car you're seeing here. Um, and that's what we call light dark flop. That's when the, um, the uh, apparent lightness of the surface um, changes uh, to our eye depending on our observation angle, and that's what causes it to uh, accentuate that curved profile and make that car look really nice. Uh, there are also uh, pearlescent coatings included in the umbrella of effect coatings, and those are coatings um, that can produce what we call a color flop effect. Um, and that's where the actual color, not just the lightness, but the, the hue of the, um, the coating can change, the, again, depending on your observation angle. Um, and there are also other types of uh, effect pigments like xeralix, which provide a, a special glitter effect. Uh, so again, here's a, a slightly more technical view of these different types of pigments. Um, so the first one at the top that we're seeing, um, those are the absorption pigments I mentioned. And those are just our normal everyday pigments. Um, those are the types of pigments that are in your, your fabrics, your clothing. Uh, you know, if you have a, a plastic uh, plain colored cup, um, the, those are absorption pigments causing it to be that color. So those are the pigments that just um, absorb, selectively absorb um, different wavelengths of light 
uh, and reflect certain wavelengths of light, and that's just what gives uh, objects their color. So these are our everyday pigments um, that are used in solid colors and could be measured with a solid color spectrophotometer, um, like our Spectra 2 guide instrument. Uh, but we also have uh, the effect pigments. So absorption pigments are not effect pigments, uh, but metallics and pearl luster pigments are. Um, and so again, those metallic pigments, that's the one we saw on that silver car um, that uh, accentuated the curved profile due to the light dark flop. Um, and the reason for that is what you, you see with these metallic pigments is you get a mirror-like reflection of the light. So whereas materials like paint and plastic, um, they uh, undergo a significant amount of absorption of the light. When light hits it, um, paints and plastics are going to absorb a lot of that light. Metallics or metals um, have near total reflection of the light. So you're going to get a very, very bright flash off of those metallic pigments, much brighter than you would get off of any sort of paint or plastic or, or non-metal surface. Um, and so not only uh, does that cause that light dark flop, um, but it also causes this sort of brilliant sparkly effect that we get, um, that we can see on cars when we're standing close enough to it. And that's a, a pleasing effect to our eye. Uh, and then we have those pearl luster pigments, and those, again, are the ones uh, that cause the color flop. Um, that's the one that caused the color hue of your uh, material, of your coating, to change depending on your observation angle. Um, and that's due to certain interference effects um, where the different uh, uh, photons of light are sort of mixing and interfering with each other to cause this color change effect um, as you go from angle to angle. So due to those effects, uh, when we measure color um, with uh, effect pigments, we need to measure it at multiple angles because the, uh, the lightness or the color hue of that color um, can change from observation angle to observation angle. In order to fully characterize the color uh, of such a coating, we can't just measure it at one angle, we have to measure it at multiple angles because it's uh, it's possible that such a, a surface um, could match, uh, or two surfaces could match under uh, at one measurement angle or one observation angle, um, but not match at another. So it's important to measure color at multiple angles when it comes to effect pigments um, so we can make sure that the color matches at all angles. And here we have an example of a multicolor uh, measurement um, with such a device using, um, uh, th this is done with our BICMAC multi-angle spectrophotometer, and we can see here the six spectral curves. Um, this is the spectral reflectance data obtained by uh, the BICMAC at each of these six measurement angles. Um, so we can see that the, the spectral curves for each of these angles, they're pretty much right on top of each other. They're very, very, very close. Um, which indicates that the color at each of these angles is going to be pretty much the same. And we can see, if we look at the, the title of this slide, we can see this is a solid green color. And that's the reason that it's the same at all angles, because this only has absorption pigments in it. This is a, a solid color, um, and we don't typically expect <clears throat> solid colors um, to uh, change their appearance depending on angles. So typically, solid colors can be measured at just one, um, one measurement angle in order to get an accurate color measurement. But in contrast to that, we now have a metallic green. So this is now a green color, um, but with metallic flake mixed into it. And we can see what that does to the spectral curves. So um, again, we have the six spectral curves for the color measurement taken at uh, these six different measurement angles. Um, and again, we can see with these curves that they're pretty much all the same shape, um, but they vary in the reflectance level. So what this tells me is that the hue, um, that green color, uh, is going to be pretty much the same from angle to angle, um, but because the reflectance percentage, the reflectance levels are varying, um, that's going to vary the lightness level. Um, so I can see just from these spectral curves that this coating, this metallic green coating is going to exhibit um, 
light dark flop where the color hue doesn't change but the lightness change from, changes from measurement angle to measurement angle and this is of course why we measure at six angles um, to capture what this color looks like at each of these um, at each of these different angles uh, next up we have an example of a metallic silver um, so we're seeing pretty much the same thing we saw with that metallic green um, where the uh, the shape of these different uh, spectral curves at, at each of these angles is pretty much the same. Um, it's a very flat curve indicating it's going to be a neutral color. Um, but because it is a silver, um, it's, it's uh, has lots of metallic pigments in it. It's going to be very, very highly reflective, and it's going to um, undergo lots of light dark flop from angle to angle, particularly if you look at the scale of this slide, um, the percentage is on the left compared to our metallic green. Um, so there's going to be some slight light dark flop with our metallic green. Um, there's going to be a huge amount of flop with our metallic silver. Um, and this is what we saw in that image of that uh, silver car we saw earlier. And so this is an example of a, uh, a color changing coating, a, a, a coating that's exhibiting color flop. Um, and here, instead of seeing the spectral curves, we're seeing the um, each of the, the measurements at each angle plotted on the AB plane. Um, and we can see from these measurements, um, these are the five standard angles, the 15, 45, 75, 110, uh, missing one of them. Um, but so we can see that from angle to angle, this color changing surface uh, at first gets a little bit greener, and then it's getting bluer and redder, which indicates it's getting uh, more purple, um, which we can kind of see from the image that at certain angles, um, it does exhibit a, a purple color. Um, and then specifically for uh, interference pigments, we do have this sixth angle. So this didn't used to be a typical part of the um, standard multi-angle color setup. Um, it used to just be the, the 15, 25, 45, 75, and 110. Um, we introduced uh, this new negative 15 degree angle, this what we call behind the gloss angle because it's, it's behind the specular angle of the light source. Um, and this one was added specifically to characterize uh, interference pigments um, that are <clears throat> displaying this color flop effect. So we can see that um, there's some slight color change as it goes through these uh, five standard angles, but once it reaches the negative 15 degree angle, um, it, it goes way, way out um, up to it gets uh, uh, redder and yellower. Next up, we're going to talk about uh, how to characterize these effect pigments directly. So um, under direct illumination, when you're dealing with these effect pigments, particularly um, things like metallic pigments, uh, like aluminum flake, um, what you get under direct lighting conditions are this, uh, this effect that could be referred to as sparkle, micro, brightness, glints, diamonds. Um, the viewing conditions for this are, again, uh, spotlight conditions, so uh, direct lighting, not diffuse lighting, um, for example, under direct sunlight. So if you have a, um, a surface with metallic pigments out under um, direct sunlight, it's not a cloudy day, you're, you can see the sun, uh, that's when you're really going to see this sparkle effect. Now for this effect, um, the um, angle is critical, uh, particularly even more than the observation angle, the illumination angle is critical in um, how we see the sparkle effect. And that effect is generated by things like the individual reflectivity of these pigments, uh, how much of these pigments there are, and the size of the individual pigments. These are all going to affect um, that, uh, uh, what we see as far as um, the, the sparkle in the so the other effect we can get with metallic pigments, uh, it's called graininess. And where is, whereas um, sparkle is an appealing effect, something we want to see, 
Uh, graininess is not. This is something that um, often happens with um, metallic coatings, uh, and it happens only under diffuse lighting. So whereas with sparkle, you can only see that under um, direct, bright direct lighting. Um, graininess, you're only going to see that under diffuse lighting. For example, um, when the skies are cloudy, that serves to diffuse the sunlight. Um, so the viewing conditions, again, diffused light, close observation distance. It's not something you're going to see from very far away. Um, and the ob it's independent of observation angles. So you can see the same thing no matter what angle you're looking at. Uh, so some potential causes of this graininess effect include um, the flake type, the material itself, uh, the flake size, um, the orientation of, or disorientation of those flakes. So there's a certain way they should be ideally oriented to provide the, uh, the, the most sparkle and the least graininess. And uh, if they're disoriented, that can cause graininess. And also agglomeration of particles. And that's where um, these individual particles that have been dispersed into these, uh, you know, these tiny little particles um, sometimes come together and stick together and form larger particles. And that's generally undesirable. And that's referred to as agglomeration. So how do we characterize these effect pigments? Well, one way to start with is using color. Uh, the problem is color measurement is the integral of the spectral reflection over the measured area, meaning it's not going to be picking out these effect pigments specifically. It's sort of just averaging everything it sees um, within the, um, the measurement area of the spectrophotometer. Um, and this, by the way, is why we see um, light dark flop and why the instrument measures light dark flop, because those bright reflections, um, those individual reflections off of those metallic pigments, um, the, the brightness uh, or how much of that reflection you're getting is going to be very, very angle dependent. So some angles are going to get a brighter reflection off of those metallic pigments than other angles, and when the spectrophotometer measures it, um, or when we look at it at different angles, um, both are doing the same thing. Our eyes are sort of uh, just averaging um, both the color uh, of those absorption pigments that are in the base coat, as well as those uh, bright reflections off of the metallic pigments. And that since those reflections are going to change, uh, the brightness of those reflections will change from angle to angle. Um, the average of that color reading from angle to angle um, is going to show different lightness values. So that's why we see light dark flop, and that's why the instrument measures light dark flop. But that measurement, um, even at all these angles, is not good enough to um, specifically characterize these effect pigments. Um, there's no differentiation between the base coat color and reflection of the effect flakes. Um, and yeah, they can't be sufficiently characterized. So. What do we do? Uh, we need to develop a solution to characterize the total color impression. And so that includes not only the multi-angle color measurement, but also this flake characterization that was uh, introduced with the Big Mac. And so the way this works, the Big Mac has a built-in camera. It has a CCD chip, which is just a chip that can uh, uh, take pictures. And uh, for the sparkle measurement, the uh, surface is illuminated at three different angles um, individually and a picture taken at each angle. Um, so this is not all at the same time. First, it would light up the 15 degree uh, illumination and take a picture. That one would shut off and then the 45 degree and then the 75 degree. So um, pictures are taken under each individual lighting condition um, to simulate, in this case, a sunny sky. Um, and so then the sparkling impression can be evaluated under those three different illumination angles. Um, and also, uh, it provides diffuse illumination, and a picture is taken under that condition to uh, measure and to characterize the graininess effect. So you get three illumination angles, three direct illumination angles for sparkle, and uh, diffuse lighting to characterize graininess. And so that chip takes pictures of the surface, and those pictures look like this. So the top two are uh, pictures taken under direct illumination. So this is for the 
sparkle characterization. Um, and we can see um, th those little white dots, um, hopefully you can pick those out in those images, those little white dots are the bright reflections off of those um, me metallic pigments. And you can see those bright reflections um, are different. These are, are two pictures taken under different illumination angles. And we can see that um, how heavily the illumination angle affects uh, what we see, those, um, those bright reflections off of those metal pigments. And then when we illuminate the surface under uh, diffused lighting and take a picture, what we get is the picture we see in the bottom, which is showing that uh, sort of salt, pepper, snow on a TV screen sort of effect. And that's what, what uh, graininess is. Um, so in order to characterize uh, sparkle and graininess, the instrument will then analyze these pictures. And so the way it does that for sparkle, uh, it detects the total sparkle area. So that's the total amount of area in the image um, that's exhibiting those, those white spots, that very bright reflection off of the, the metal pigments. And it also measures the intensity of the flash of the, uh, of the reflection off of each of those individual metal pigments. So you get two um, metrics, uh, sparkle area and sparkle intensity, and then those can be combined into an overall sparkle measurement. Okay, next up, we're going to talk very briefly about uh, color difference equations before we get to our question and answer session. So this is the DIN 6175 part two equation uh, for specifically for effect pigments, um, for metallic pigments. And so this is the um, sort of main, um, the, the, the most used difference equation that many automakers um, base their difference equation off of. So um, often there are some small modifications to this, um, but this is the basis for most difference equations used in the industry. Um, and the way it works is that you get uh, weighting factors. Uh, so the delta E value is weighted uh, depending um, not only on the position of the standard in color space, because different colors will have different visual tolerances, um, but it's also weighted by the um, angle of measurement. There's going to be a little more leeway um, as far as calculating the delta E value for some angles um, rather, um, other than uh, other angles. Um, and you can see from this that there is a different equation used depending on whether um, the, uh, the coding being measured is chromatic or non-chromatic. And so chromatic, um, do I have a slide on that? Yes. Um, so chromatic colors are colors we consider to be um, co uh, colors with a chroma value, a C value greater than 10 are considered chromatic if the L value is less than 27. If the L value is greater than 27 um, and the color has a C value greater than 18, that's considered chromatic. Anything else is considered non-chromatic or a, a neutral or near neutral color. Um, and that matters because the equation changes depending on whether we're dealing with chromatic or non-chromatic colors. Um, so you can see the, the one at the top uh, uses LAB values um, because typically LAB is better for, um, for tolerancing when you're dealing with achromatic colors, non-chromatic colors. Uh, and the chromatic equation uses LCH. Um, because typically LCH is better for tolerancing when using uh, or when dealing with chromatic colors. Okay, and so this equation also has uh, what we call application factors, um, which is another weighting factor that is dependent on um, the actual application of the coding. Um, so, for example, uh, when um, QCing or when, uh, when approving an incoming paint batch, typically the tolerances are going to be tighter um, than for the actual paint line. Uh, and tolerances on the paint line are typically going to be tighter than for those on uh, a repair line. So the, um, the equation actually changes depending on 
uh, the, the application that you're using, whether it's a repair shop or fresh off the line at the factory. Um, and that actually affects um, not only the uh, stated delta E tolerance, um, but also how that delta E value is calculated. So it will actually be calculated differently um, depending on the, the G factors, the application factors. And here are some, uh, some more equations that are often used um, in uh, um, the first one is delta E total, and this is sort of uh, an average of all the delta E's across all the different uh, measurement angles. Um, or as many different measurement angles as are being used. Um, so you can see in this example, um, this is only using five out of the six measurement angles. And so um, the uh, denominator is, is five uh, rather than six. Um, so that's uh, sort of the, the average delta E across all the angles. And then we have the delta S, which is the um, delta sparkle. And that actually uh, takes into account not just the sparkle, but the graininess as well. So, you could say the delta S is the um, overall effect difference, um, perhaps. Um, and so that is sort of the average of all the sparkle differences um, for the three illumination angles plus the, the difference in the graininess between standard and sample. And so with those, you get an overall measure of the color difference with the delta ET. You get an overall measure of the effect difference with uh, the delta ST. Um, and those two can also be combined into the delta S E, which is the overall difference um, taking into account both the color and the effect characterization. And then, so this is a table um, giving uh, just a few automakers and how they use these equations. Um, for example, the delta E GM equation. So these are equations that we um, put into our instruments and our software at the behest of, of these, um, these car makers. Um, so we often work closely with our customers to introduce um, new scales and equations and things. And so the delta EGM equation uses the delta SE value. So it uses the, the one value that takes into account um, the, the color difference and the effect characterization differences across all angles. Um, the delta E Kia equation uses um, both the delta S E as well as the uh, delta E total and delta S total, uh, where it's the delta E Ford and delta E SCA, um, which I believe is called Stellantis now, um, they use the delta E total. So just an example of how um, these equations are used in, uh, in industry. And that concludes my presentation for today, and I will pass things back to Mr. Kowalski for our Q&A. Thanks, Corey. Nice job, as always. Um, one comment here from uh, John. Uh, he had some problems logging into WebEx um, and asking about recording, the recording of the event. Yes, we are sending out the, the full recording. Um, that will come tomorrow in an email, um, along with the, the presentation that Corey just ran through. And then also, um, good news, um, the platform WebEx that we are uh, looking at and using now and that we have, have used for the past several years, this is the very last event that we are having via WebEx. We are shifting our platform to click meeting. Um, things will run the same. It's probably, or no, it's not probably, it will be a lot easier getting on. We've, we've had struggles internally too. So. Um, big woohoo for that. Uh, this is the last WebEx. Um, so anyway, if you have any questions, um, please log them in the Q&A box. We'll get to them uh, and uh, help, help you out there. Um, message just came in from John. Uh, have you measured the color of photoluminescent coatings in both daylight and nighttime uh, lighting conditions? I don't believe we have done any studies on photoluminescence um, because I, I'm, I take it those are coatings that uh, give off light of their own, um, like the old, you know, glow in the dark stuff that you, know, you expose to sunlight. And when it's in the dark, it gives off colors. Is there, uh, light is that what we're dealing with? Um, 
but yeah, no, unfortunately, we haven't done any studies. I'm, I'm not certain a, uh, a reflectance spectrophotometer like this would be the right tool. You might actually need a uh, spectroradiometer for that. Hey, John, this is Greg. Um, yeah, hey, Greg. Um, the, there has been some work done. It's been more on a, a research level because you have to modify the spectrophotometer not to use the built-in light source. So um, I know there's been some design work done and um, not only a BIC, but in, in the industry through just color experts uh, where they've modified the instruments. So they expose the coating and then they basically do a time measurement study where the spectrophotometer can be triggered to take, make a measurement, but the light source does not come on. And if there's interest in that, uh, please reach out and yeah. we can have yeah. further conversation. Yeah. Um, John, I'm going to unmute you here, if that's okay. Um, there sure. you go. Um, it, yeah, and he did follow up to, um, yes, glow in the dark coatings, and he could provide samples if helpful. Yes, that'd be so, fine. So, I just said another comment that would in the, the type of market that we're talking about here. Uh, besides, obviously, the artistic market, uh, the functional markets are like crosswalk coatings in low lit areas where the crosswalk itself is emitting light for 10 to 12 hours. Correct. Theme parks, stuff like that is of interest. Yeah, one of the concerns there is uh, being able to measure the light not only in the hue that it's giving, but also how the eye views it. Because one oddity with this is if you have too much of the light source, the individual observing it will lose their depth perception and therefore their balance. For example, if we do a whole fire escape, indoor fire escape, emergency escape, and you coat the entire uh, top and the bull nose and the, the front of the, of the uh, stairs, when they get to the top of the stairs, they can no longer see the differential and therefore they just fall down the stairs because the eye receives it as one continuous. Mm -hmm. So some of the study areas would be how much light can you actually admit before the natural eye can't handle it anymore. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll reach out to you and um, that would be great if you could uh, provide some samples and we, we can run some tests on it. Sure. Um, if, if you don't mind, we re really appreciate that. So we'll, we'll re reach out to you, John. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, uh, next one from Renu. Um, where did you get the pigments uh, for some of these studies? In particular, the blue to green pigment earlier in the talk. Remember that, Corey? No idea. Anyone else? The uh, the pigments for some of the, the studies or some of the data in in the presentation near the beginning, um, in particular the blue and green pigment. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, Typic uh, radio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe I I believe those were. Uh, colors that included chroma flare pigments in them, but I'm not 100%. So can you unmute whoever asked the question so we can? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, Renu, you're unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, thank you. How are you? Hi. Yeah, no. Um... I was just curious to know where um, we can get some of these pigments. Um, so I thought since you studied them, you might know of a good supplier or, um, yeah. That, so um, for chroma, chroma flare, I haven't heard of them yet, but. <laughs> Vidia so. is, the, is the company now. Um, I know Merck has some strong hue shifting pigments. Um, 
Eckert actually has some too. Uh, most of the pigment suppliers have some type of hue shifting pigments. Uh, one of the things that we've seen develop over the years is a more complex uh, number of pigments that are being offered. Uh, they're, they're made in a different fashion, most of them through a vapor deposition prop process. And so that's um, something that a lot of people have adopted. Yeah, I'm looking at these in a non-automotive environment. And um, when we've tried to use some of these pigments, um, we, we don't see these changes. So maybe it's the way we are applying them or um, they get lost in our coating that we're putting them in or something. So is it really important that you have the color shift? Yes, that is our value add that we're trying to do for our customers. If we wanted one color, we already have that, so. And that, that could be a, a, a long discussion, but I'm willing to, we can follow up with you. Um, there's a number of things that you can do um, to increase or enhance that color shift. That would be awesome. I'd love to have a discussion. Okay. I'll, we'll follow I'll up. Find. <laughs> I don't want to bother everyone. <laughs> no, no worries. No bother at all. So we're here to help, but uh, we'll follow up with you. Okay. We appreciate okay. it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I totally measure it, but I'm sorry, that wasn't oh, clear. I yeah. said, and we can get things. So. You're, you're breaking up there, Ray. Oh, sorry. We can measure oh, it. Which is the yeah, you still broke up a bit. So I'm that's so okay. sorry. Yeah, it keeps coming. Yeah. Breaking up yeah. at the same point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No worries. <laughs> we'll follow up with you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next uh, question we have here. Uh, uh, is, is there a difference if I use solvent-based or water-based paint? So I say you can get the same appearance from either. And I know there's a bunch of people on the line that are going to disagree with me, but <laughs> that's Any, anybody else in, want to chime in, in? In general, I would agree with Ray. Um, it, it might take more effort in one or the other, but um, if you're looking for a certain type of color and effect, you should be able to achieve it in both. Tatiana, it might, did that, did that answer your be, question? I'm, I'm going to unmute can, you here. Can there you are. Can you hear us in Brazil? Yeah, I, I don't thank know. you. So it might be harder in one coating than another, but in the end, everyone should go to the same center standard and match that because that's the best option that you have. Does that help? Okay, great. We'll move on here. Uh, what else do we have? Um, how many colors do you use for the uh, minus, or do you use the minus 15 for? Let me say that again. How many colors do you use the minus 15 degree angle for? So sorry, I had a bit of a dog issue. Um, oh. I can tell you from like Jam's perspective that they, it's about maybe 15%. And we're talking about over a hundred standards. Okay. Okay. Another question here. What are the methods of applying the colors shown in the presentation? How would those color effect readings differ from other methods 
such as vinyl wrappings, if there's any data on that. So the application process in in like wraps or extrusions or uh, coil coating, uh, the application itself can affect the alignment of or misalignment of the of the pigmentation, the effect pigmentation. So you, you'd have to look at the actual process itself. But um, a lot of times you'll get. Um, pigments that line up in, in, in a given direction, which get, means that you have high directionality depending upon which way you look at the sample and which way you measure the sample. But that's okay. a very specific question. I think we'd have to look at the exact application. Okay. Yeah, we, we can follow up uh, with you there. Um, another question here from John. Can the color measuring equipment differentiate uh, metameristic effects of the coating pigment. Are you saying metamerism? I think that, John, I'm going to mute you here. Is, is that correct, John? Metamerism? Yes, metamerism. The, the issue is we deal with flexible coatings, and as your angle of uh, view changes, the color seems to change. Okay, so explain to us for a second your process and what you're trying to accomplish. Well, our, our solution would be to maintain the same color, even though you're at a different, your view angle may be the same, but because of the flexibility in the coating, you know, the light is interacting or, uh, or reflecting off the coating at a different angle. So, Greg, this is not metamerism. This is different concept. Does the material have effect pigment in it? Yes. It's metallic. Yeah. So you're you're gonna get um that's that's inherent in the in the coating. Yeah. The the uh, the flexibility is, and the you know we can put different levels of uh, metallic in it. And different kinds of metallic. So that is part of the customer's buying, yes. So what industry are you in? Just so we understand. Uh, industrial and automotive. So we do some other things also that this comes into play is uh, safety coatings that change color with temperature. Yeah, this is also a problem. Um, in SmartChart, there's a way to measure the temperature when you measure the coating, and that might be helpful to you. Okay. I always talk about it offline, but, I mean, there's some pigments that don't like high temperatures, and when you measure them too early, they end up reading different. And then... The angles, it, it, we would have to see it because yeah, I don't we actually. We can do that yeah. offline. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll follow up with you, John. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, Let's see here. Yeah, if anyone, you know, keep the questions coming. We have some time left, so enter them in the Q&A box. A um, couple more here. Um, so what sparkle angle matches to what you see visually? Okay, so perhaps I can answer that. So if you're looking, you have to understand that the sparkle angles aren't the same angles as the color measurement. So the 15 is pretty much the face, and the 60 is pretty much if you're like kind of walking by the vehicle and looking back. 
So just be careful with those two measurements because the angles don't match up. I mean, I don't know if Corey can pull that up again fast. If he can't, then. Which one do you want? I want the one that shows like all the angles that the instrument measures for color and effect. So Corey's going to show you, but you have to be careful because, yeah, this, that one is good. Okay. So basically, like, if you look at the 15 angle for color, it's not going to be anywhere the same for the 15 angle for sparkle. So 15 is basically looking straight on, and the 60 is looking at the flop. I mean, if anyone disagrees with me who's from BIC on the phone, that's cool, but that's what I've seen when I've done some work. And the 45 angle to me is not so much a big deal. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, as everybody can tell, we have um, you know a few people on um, from our, our team. Um, you just heard that was Ray Roby. She's our business line manager for automotive. Also, Greg Schreider um, was chiming in earlier. He's our key account manager and also a business line manager for Refinish and um, Hank Coatings Bankers. Um, so we have a lot of expertise on the phone here and uh, we're able to answer answer your questions or, you know, in some of these cases that involve some further discussion, uh, we can definitely follow up with you offline. Um, so if you have anything, drop it in the Q&A box. Um, next question here I have, uh, can you go over the calculated values um, again? Would you mind, Corey? I know that's your favorite part too. I've heard that. <laughs> what? I've heard this part's Corey's favorite, the calculated values. Oh, I, I, I didn't hear, I didn't get that part. <laughs> All right, Corey, you're up. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so these are oh. just sort of a way of, um, sort of agglomerating the uh, different values that you, you'd measure with the instrument. Because you get, with the Big Mac, you get a ton of different values because you're measuring color at six different angles. You're getting six different sets of LAB or LCH values. You're getting six different Delta E values. Um, and of course, you're getting three uh, sparkle values and the graininess values. So this is a way of sort of simplifying things um, whenever possible. It's always preferred, of course, to look at fewer numbers in order to determine your pass or fail, um, to, to, you know, specify based on fewer numbers. It's just easier for everyone that way. So the way these have been condensed, um, this delta E total value, the first one, um, also referred to as the delta E T, is just sort of a way of, um, of giving you, uh, it's not exactly an average, it's a root mean square, but something akin to an average delta E across all the different measurement angles. Um, and so that can just give you an, a sort of an overall picture of how good the color match is, um, uh, you know, uh, across all these different observations. So delta E T is only color. It only takes into account uh, those six angles of color measurement, nothing to do with the sparkle and graininess. Um, the delta S total or delta ST um, is where you see the, the effect measurement, and that's um, the sort of averaging of the um, that flake characterization. So it's taking uh, the delta S, and remember these come from both the um, the sparkle intensity and the sparkle area. Um, so uh, those two uh, measurements, those two scales are combined to create a, um, uh, an overall sparkle rating um, at each angle. And then when you have a standard sample, you can, you can uh, calculate the overall sparkle difference 
um, between standard and sample for a given angle. So that's what these are, the S, delta S15, 45, 75. Those are the, uh, the difference in the measured sparkle values between standard and sample um, at each of those illumination angles. And then you add in the, the difference in the graininess value as well. Um, and of course, divide by four. So that's um, sort of a more or less averaging of all the different um, flake characterization scales to give you one um, effect characterization number, the delta ST. Um, so these, the delta ET and the delta ST are uh, when you take those two sets of measurements, uh, the color and then the flake characterization and condense those down and then those two can give you combined into a single value as well, the delta SE, um, which takes into account both the delta E total and the delta S total. So these are um, condensed uh, calculations, um, condensed scales that can be used to um, more easily um, tolerance um, a, a standard without having to specify every uh, you know, delta LAB value at every angle. Great. Thank you for, for going through that again, Corey. Appreciate that. Um, another question here, this might be for Ray. Um, why do different customers use different ways of pass fail? You muted, Ray? Can you hear me? Lose We're not hearing you. Oh, now we can oh, hear there you. you are. There you go. Yeah. So Why do different like, customers use different ways of pass fail? So different people decide different things because of what? Okay, first of all, you know, with the sparkling graininess, I mean, that's something super new to the industry. So, like, everybody's not going to want to, like, pass fail on that. Um, the Delta E total is a good number, you know, do they want to pass fail on the Delta LAB? I mean, this is totally a customer driven concept. They get to figure out what they want. And we don't always get to tell them what we think is the best, but I mean, most customers who have been using the instrument for a long time use like Delta ET and Delta ST and Delta SE. And then some think that the Delta SE is maybe too open. So they just want to use Delta ST and Delta ET. So it's super customer driven. And it's always about how the customer feel, feels about what we're going to do and how they're going to pass it out. And the other thing is, in my belief, you know, they don't want everything to fail. So they pick, you know, maybe what they think they can control the easiest and maybe not some other things. So it's all about the customer and we can make any equation, pass fail on anything, whatever anybody wants. So I think that's important that we customize everything. Good point, Ray. Great. Um, if anyone has any other questions, we, we've I've kind of gone through my list. Um, we have just a couple minutes left here. Um, please log them in the Q&A box. Um, like I said, we'll be sending out this recording as well as uh, Corey's presentation here uh, as a PDF um, tomorrow morning. So you'll get that in your inbox. Um, and uh, then also look uh, for us to reach out to you, um, you know, individually that had some questions and that need some further discussion. We'll, we'll reach out to you there. Um, but, there is, uh, oh, go ahead. There's one other thing I think is super important. Um, you can download the latest version of SmartChart off of our website, and maybe John can send that to you. Um, yeah. It, it's got a lot of improvements, and I would 
really hope that you would download that. You do need your IT people to help you download it, but it's a much better version, and I really think that that's important. So, okay. good point, Ray. I'll uh, make sure to send that link out. Um, it's on the web page. If you just go to the support page, you'll see a, a link for software downloads. Uh, but I'll put the direct link in the, the email follow up so it'll be easier for you. Um, and if you think of any other questions following this, or if you're, you're reviewing the presentation or the recording, um, you see Corey's email address on the screen. Um, you can hit reply to the um, email that you'll get from us in marketing, um, and we'll get it to, to the right experts. Um, and we'll go from there. So um, just I want to thank uh, Corey, Ray, Greg um, for all of your input and expertise. And big thank you to um, all of our attendees for joining us today. Um, hope you learned something, and we look forward to seeing you on future Big Gardener um, webinars or office hours format. So thank you, and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone.